Imagine, if you will, it's 1850. You are a signalman near a station. Long before the days of computer software, you had little communication and just a timetable of expected movements. It's straightforward enough. Goods go on sidings and through lines while passengers and expresses headed for the station. But in the days where expresses and local branch line traffic were on the same line, how do you tell them apart? You could use the timetable, of course. But if the train is late or missed its path, well, that piece of paper would be as useful as a chocolate fire guard. You couldn't tell by the type of engine either. There were simply too many to differentiate. You could look at the train, but that would only give you part of the picture. Yes, you could tell if it was goods or passengers, but is it slow goods? Is it an express goods or a special? You have to make a decision in a split second because by the time you decided what train it was and then set the road, well, that train would have been long gone. Luckily for the poor signalman, a way was developed to help them decode a train type within mere seconds, the head code. It's not really well known which railway was the first one to use the head code system. However, the use of lamps or discs on the front of the engine was well established by 1900. There were two types of head codes used pre-grouping. The lines north of London used the head codes to denote the type of train that they were, for example, express, local through train and goods. But the other type denoted what type of line and which line the train was going on. This was normally used in heavily trafficked areas, the southern reaches of the railway and shunting yards. Both worked equally well, however, due to the sheer number of lines, the codes became really confusing. As an unwritten rule, it was considered universally throughout the network to only use white lights at the front of the train, although the LNER and the Great Eastern used white and blue and white and green head coast discs respectively during the day, then would replicate the code using lamps and coloured lenses at night. The green was eventually swapped out, owing to confusion from drivers seeing the head code in the distance and passing signals assuming it was all clear. Due to the number of railways running around with their own unique head code guides, it was decided that a universal head code guide be brought up for mainline uses. Owing to the cost of oil needed to run the lamps, it was decided that less is more and that the vast majority of classifications could be shown with just two lamps and four lamp irons. Three lamp irons were placed along the platform above the engine's buffer beam, with a fourth above the smoke box door. This made things so much simpler for the signalers to read and understand. So let's have a look at the codes. The first code is using two lamps on either side of the platform. This was used on express passenger runs. These trains were given priority with other trains being moved onto through lines to make way for it. It was also the code for the breakdown gang heading to an accident. A single lamp above the smoke box door is your standard passenger train. These would also include your stopping and branch line trains, not intended to go as fast as the express, but is still important. Although many passenger services like this were regularly put onto passing loops, Otherwise, they end up with an express on their backside. Two lamps on the platform, one on the left and one in the centre, is possibly as important as express passenger runs. These express goods trains contained items that were perishable or time constrained. This included eggs, fish, milk and meat. The mail and newspaper train also used this head code as did empty, perishable coaching stock which were needed back in larger stations. This code was also used for the breakdown gang heading back from an accident. Once again, local trains made way for this important run. Although on the rare occasion that they did meet, this train was still subservient to the passenger express. One lamp on the platform's left-hand side, lamp iron, and one above the smoke box was entirely used for freight. This was either non-perishable goods, rolling stock that wasn't needed urgently, and cattle trucks. 
these trains had to be at least one third fitted with continuous braking. Continuous braking involved the use of a vacuum pipe down the train. The vacuum was created in the engine's cab. This lack of air, in turn, through a cylinder, releases the brakes on the vans. If there is a brake within the train, let's say a coupling came loose, then the pipe is designed to break apart at the connectors and let the air in. As soon as the pressure increases, the brakes come on every truck. Continuous braking systems are fitted on all coach rolling stock and the vacuum can be destroyed by either the crew or the guard in the guard's compartment. The guard also has a manual handbrake to help stop the train, but with the continuous braking system, the guard doesn't have to be at the back of the train every time to help stop it. One lamp on the train's right hand side with the smoke box lamp on is very similar to the above, however this is used exclusively for express freight or ballast. Not to be confused with perishable express freight, which is much more time sensitive, express goods were items that needed to be moved quickly around the network, but still could be shunted should a perishable and express or even a local train go past. The ballast trains were specially designed vans which would allow ballast to spill out onto the tracks. These were usually slow trains, but a ballast train could only use this head code if it was continuously fitted. One lamp in the centre of the platform and one on the smoke box were through freight or an unfitted ballast train. These were slow, often long trains that rarely stopped to let other trains through. A single lamp on the platform centre indicated the engine was running light. Shunters, bankers and maintenance trains that weren't hauling goods were commonly used this head code. To save money and time, it was common to see several engines and brake vans coupled together under this code. That way they could all head up to the station that they needed to be at using just one path. They would also expect engines going to and from the works to use this code as well. One lamp on the engine's left was either a through mineral or an empty wagon train, fitted or unfitted. These were the slowest of freight and rarely moved around at peak times and normally used at night. One lamp on the engine's right is for ordinary or standard freight or ballast. These freight trains are usually shorter and have stops at stations to help deliver and receive goods. One lamp in the centre and one lamp on the right was express freight, as well as these trains were shorter and unfitted. These were handy getting goods to nearby stations. Longer trains were permitted under this code, however they had to carry at least four fitted wagons. The final code, very rarely seen, with a lamp on each iron, is the Royal Train. This train was at the head of all the others and even expresses were shunted to make way for it. The head codes not only helped the signalers determine the type of trains coming into section, but it also added a hierarchy to the trains themselves. Expresses were considered to be of the most importance, next only to the Royal Train, with perishable freight coming in a close second. Standard freight gave way to passenger stopping trains and light engines gave way to freight. The head codes also carried a secondary effect and affected the way the signalers signal to each other up and down the line. Four beats on the bell indicated to the signaler, is the line clear for an express train? Or three beats on the bell, then a single beat, was the code for line clear for passenger dropping, etc. Because of this safety critical interdependency on the head codes, severe consequences were placed upon the crews if those head codes on the engines were incorrect. The implementation of the universal head code was recommended but not law. Therefore, some railways like the Southern refused to adopt the head code and preferred to use their own. Owing to its complexity, I feel that needs a whole other video. The LNER preferred to use their white discs instead of lamps during the day and while some railways painted their lamps white so they could readily be seen. The head code system wasn't always perfect, so to help supplement this on some trains, headboards were also given to show their reporting number, indicating what type of train it was, especially if it was a private charter or a special. On the Great Western, where there were numerous specials, it became a custom to have all trains carry their reporting number as well as their head code. The only common factor when it came to coding 
was not at the front of the train, but it was at the back. It was regulation across all railways, charters or private companies using the tracks. All of them must have at least one red tail lamp at the back of the train. A red tail lamp on the back of the train is an indication to all that the train is complete. In the days where coaches and trucks were not continuously fitted, occasionally, either due to a one coupling or if the train had been incorrectly coupled, then the carriage can break away from the rest of the train. Sometimes the crew would even be unaware that part of their train was missing. If they were missing part of the train, then the signaller would know instantly and stop the train to indicate the problem. The red tail lamp would also have a secondary service and alert any train coming into section behind them that they were there and to stop. It was also against regulation that an engine can back down onto a stationary train with a red lamp showing. The red lamp tells the crews that the train must not be moved and is commonly used by guards to stop engines backing onto trains while they are working around the carriages. It is normal to have at least one tail lamp, but having more is just as good. Side lamps were very useful, indicating to a crew at the front that they have a complete train. Although it quickly died out, rear codes were sometimes used as well. For example, the LNER used a pair of horizontal rear lamps indicating a streamlined express, but if arranged vertically, it indicated that a train was divided or that a special was following. The practice quickly fizzled away as many saw it as a waste of lamp oil. Multiple tail lamps though are a must on one type of coach. That was the slip coaches. The slip coaches are the only rolling stock that has to carry a head code as well as its own tail lamp. The headlamp or disc was as standard as you would expect to find anywhere, but the tail lamps were unique. There were two lamps placed horizontally across and each lamp was encircled by a red and white disc. Depending on where the coaches were to be slipped off depended on the position and the number of lights. Due to the sheer number of coaches and slips that had to be done, it wasn't uncommon that these trains had to carry 10 to 20 lamps per journey. The idea of the reporting numbers on trains though began to catch on and many railways liked the idea of giving a train a unique identifier depending on where they were going. The newer diesel engines had provision for one or the other, although the four digit code was now becoming the norm. In 1960, all trains were classified by the same system in use today. This is a four character code that denotes the train, the type, the class and where it is going. As the network moved from physical labour switching to computerised signalling, the head codes fell out of service in favour of these new classes. Today, trains do not need to display head codes at all, as their movements are fed into a centralised computer database and the control team can tell which engine is where and where it is going as quickly as the signaller looking out of the window. The classes on the codes are denoted by the first number. These were updated in 2017 and show us 1. Express passenger train, parcel train or any fast train such as breakdown train or snowplow. 2. Ordinary passenger train. 3. Authorised freight train or authorised parcel train. 4. Freight with a speed restriction of 75 miles an hour. 5. Empty coaching stock. 6. Freight with a speed restriction of 60 miles an hour. 7. Freight with a speed restriction of 45 miles an hour. 8. Freight with a speed restriction of 35 miles an hour. 9. Passenger train, usually Eurostar or any other train if authorised. And 0. Light locomotive. The next character denotes where it is headed and if it is headed cross country. E is Eastern, L is Anglia, M is Midlands including Northern Counties, O is Southern, S is Scotland and V is Western. If an engine is working internally within a region, then that region will assign a letter to its particular city. The only letters not normally used are Q for network rail, X and Z which are reserved for special uses. The last two letters are used to separate individual services or to indicate the route. Head codes may not be visible today, but they are still around. If you go to Railcam and look at the diagrams, they're fairly easy to spot. I personally prefer the use of lamps. 
Call me old fashioned, but seeing the old hair codes being used for intended drains is still exciting. But it's worth learning codes. They give an insight into what's waiting the train spotter long before the train comes round the bend.